Holy Spirit, you are already here, so help us to listen. Speak to us the word of life and give us some of that living water. May we taste it in our lives, grasp it with our minds, embrace it with our hearts, and share it with the world. Through Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Early in the morning, when the air was still cool, before the sun was high in the sky, the women of the village walked together to draw water from the well. They gathered not only to fill their jars, but also to greet one another, to talk about their lives, to exchange whatever news there was to share. But it's not until noon when the Samaritan woman in our story makes her way to the well. In the heat of the desert midday sun, she could fully expect that everyone else would be gone. Perhaps she was purposely trying to avoid the others. Perhaps she was one of the things the others wagged their tongues about. Perhaps she came because she was thirsty for something she could not even name. Whatever the reason, she surely thought she would be all alone. But when she gets there, she is surprised to see Jesus sitting there by the well waiting for her. He is a stranger to her. She sees that he is a Jew, an outsider, an enemy. In any ordinary circumstance, they never would have spoken to each other. To reach her, Jesus had to cross boundaries, both religious and geographical. Instead of taking the nine-hour trip around Samaria, as was the custom for most Jews, Jesus proceeded right through the middle of shunned territory. In risking a conversation with her, Jesus also ignores all the traditional taboos about interactions between men and women. Men, after all, did not speak to women in public, except when absolutely necessary, and even then, only briefly. But the conversation they share is anything but brief. They talk for a long time. The scripture passage is, in fact, the longest conversation between Jesus and any other person in all of the Gospels. Jesus is not in a hurry. He doesn't rush things along. There is no business more pressing than the present, nothing more important than this moment. Evidently weary from his journey and thirsty from the hot sun, he needs a drink, and she has a jar. Give me some water, he begins. With the silence now broken between them, their talk touches on many things, about the surprising nature of this interaction, about the age-old rift between Samaritans and Jews, and about water about the difference between water that quenches thirst for a moment and water that freshes souls for eternity. That's the water I want, we hear her say. Give me some of that water. Having already intruded on her solitude, Jesus then breaks into her life. Go call your husband, he says. I have no husband, she admits. I know that, he says, but there is more to your story. There have been five husbands, and the man you are with now is not your husband. It's a dramatic revelation, leaving biblical commentators to wag their tongues for centuries. Was she in the habit of casually or callously tossing others aside? Or was she the one who had been continually rejected? Or was it that her life 
had been filled with tragedy and deaths. We don't know. We do know that the restrictions women endured in ancient cultures meant there were few decisions they were free to make about their own lives. That's still true in many places of the world. We also know that a woman who found herself without a man quite often drowned in poverty or teetered on the edge of perpetual danger. While the complete details of her story are hidden from us, what springs abundantly clear is that her life overflows with empty promises and broken relationships, with rejection and loss and loneliness, each one a kind of death that leaves her invisible and isolated. But when she meets Jesus there, beside the well, he shows her that she is not alone. He speaks to her as if he already knows her. He tells her everything she has ever done. There are no secrets. Nothing is hidden. And did you notice? There is also no judgment. He looks at her past without blinking. Jesus knows the story of her life, but he does not criticize her. He does not chastise her, correct her, or give her advice. There is no judgment. And as the truth of her life is revealed in this conversation, so is his. I know that the Messiah is coming, she says, and then he tells her, I am he. In John's Gospel, it's the very first time that he says that to another living soul. It's a moment of full disclosure. By telling her who she is, Jesus also shows her who he is. Distance dissolves into relationship. Enmity melts into mutual care. Here in the bright light of the noonday sun, they see each other face to face. Preacher Barbara Brown Taylor helps us understand this encounter. The Messiah is the one in whose presence you know who you really are, the good and the bad of it, the all of it, the hope in it. The Messiah is the one who shows you who you are by showing you who he is, the one who crosses all boundaries, breaks all rules, drops all disguises, speaking to you like someone you have known all your life, bubbling up in your life like a well that needs no dipper. And in the bright light of that revelation, in the shining and beautiful exchange, Jesus and the Samaritan woman glimpse a healing reality a new kind of community. Everything that separates the two of them, the history, the rifts, the rules, the taboos, everything that leaves her isolated falls away. The thirst of her loneliness gets quenched. Jesus was the one who had come asking for a drink of water, but her cup gets filled as well. Today, Americans are suffering our own crisis of loneliness and isolation. Recent sociological studies reveal that Americans are lonelier than ever. Medical science shows that persistent loneliness is connected to a higher risk of dementia, heart disease, and stroke. Even before the isolation of the pandemic, it was reported that on average, most adults have only two people they can talk to about the most important matters in their lives. About 25% of the adults in our country say they have no close confidant at all. A Duke University sociologist studying loneliness reports, 
The kinds of connections we studied are the kinds of people you call on for social support, for real concrete help when you need it. Far too many people lack friends to share their lives with, their concerns about their health, or who will care for their children if something happens to them. Probing more deeply into the causes of loneliness, Duke's studies this year discovered that it's not just a matter of spending time alone. On the surface, the problem of loneliness may seem cut and dry. Spend time by yourself isolated and you'll start to feel lonely. But loneliness is actually more complex than that. You can be surrounded by people all the time and still feel lonely. Duke's research found that a prolonged sense of loneliness typically peaks twice over a lifetime, among young adults and among senior adults. Interestingly, despite the age gap, young adults and seniors have similar needs. The need to be listened to and respected, and the need to contribute and give back. To overcome loneliness, researchers say, we all need others who take an interest in our experiences, people we can talk with about our lives, who appreciate the challenges we've faced, the obstacles we've overcome, and who can help us uncover who we really are. We also have a need to be able to give to others, to contribute, to teach or mentor or volunteer, to be of service, to make a difference in the life of a community. No matter how young or how old we are, the antidote to loneliness, the experts say, is a give and take, an exchange of loving and attentive care, a mutual dedication. And who better can respond to these needs than faithful congregations? Isn't that our calling as a church? It's who we are. It's who we're meant to be, a multi-generational community of care where people can turn to one another to share our lives, to tell our truths and have them heard to ask for support and to receive it, to extend and exchange loving care, to fill each other's cups with life-giving water, filling them to overflowing so that we can then pour out our lives as witnesses of the love we have known, pouring them out in care and compassion everywhere we go. As Jesus meets the Samaritan woman in her loneliness and opens the truth about her life, he also discloses his own life. He tells her he is the one who has come to reveal that the time is at hand when all that divides and isolates people from one another will be overcome. The potential held in that promise does not escape her. She knows she has just taken a deep drink of that living water. And filled now to overflowing with that good news, she turns and rushes back to the village as if riding a river of rapids. In her eagerness to share what she has just experienced, she drops everything, leaving her water jar behind plunging into town to tell everyone about Jesus, about a soul thirst she didn't even know she had, about a tender exchange of truths, about a grace she has just tasted. It's a story that pours out of her. There is a Messiah who sits beside the well waiting for us to arrive, she might have said, who sees us and knows us, everything we have ever done, 
and who loves us no matter what, who wants more than anything else to undo our isolation, to overcome our separation, to free us from our loneliness so that we can become who we are meant to be. Adding our voices to hers, we might say there is a God loving us, freeing us, sending us to share this grace with others, sending us as witnesses and as a church to be a vessel of care for one another and for the world. God wants to overcome our loneliness so that we can fill empty cups wherever we find them with living water pouring out our lives to cool the hot frictions of our families, our politics, our workplaces, our wider community, our suffering world. At the end of her story, the gospel tells us that many of the Samaritans who heard her witness go out to meet Jesus for themselves. We might say that the church is born here beside the well in the filling of cups with life-giving water, in the truthful exchange of care and compassion, in the overcoming of separation and the undoing of isolation, in the creation of community. The church is born here in a loving conversation that never ends. Amen.